Uh -huh. I invited everyone to stand on their feet in the honor of the word of God. Our sermon this week is taken from the Judges 4. Um, we're going to read from verse 1 to 10. Let's read it together. Deborah and Barak. And the people of Israel did again, again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in the Hazor. The commander of this army was Sisera, who lived in the Haraset um, Hagim. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for the 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, a wife of Lapidot, and a judging Israel at the time, she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill of country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, and the cadet Naphtali, and said to him, He has not doubt the Lord, as I commanded you. Go, gather your men at the Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon and his chariot and his troop. And I will give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going to will not lead you to, to, to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera in the hands of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went to Barak Kadas. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadas. And 10,000 men went up near this hill, and Deborah went up with him. This is the, word, the word of the Lord. Lord. You guys may be seated. I'm sorry for that. I think I thought I already said uh, the first is from verse 4 to 10. Maybe I typed the wrong one. People have their own ways of telling stories. But I think we can divide it into two main ways. The first one is my mom's way of telling stories. I don't know about you, but my mom loved to tell stories a bit too much. Bless her heart. There are many times that she will come to my room uninvitedly and start telling me random stories without my consent. And she will start tell, telling her stories by introducing the people in the stories. Okay, and then she will explain how this person, she related to that person, how that person is to relate to this person, and how they related to her. And then the story will advance, but not far. And then she has to explain the location where the stories take place. And then she'll explain to me how she ended up to be there, why that place is important. You know, if, if for example, if a coffee place, she will tell me why the coffee is so good there. And then the story will advance again, but not far. Because then she will meet another person in that cafe, and then she'll tell me how that person is related to her. And then the story will advance again. And so it would go on and on and on and on. To the point that almost every possible tangent is explored and explained to the point that I have no idea what it is she's trying to tell me. Like at that time, I really, really feel like quoting what Jesus said to her mom, his mom, woman, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> but if I say that, I might get cut off the house. So instead of saying, mom, focus, focus, what's the point? So that's the first way of telling stories. It's like rambling with a lot of branches in the story. Now, the second way to tell a story is my way of telling a story. Simply giving informations and omit the all non-essential information. Simply giving fact after fact after fact after fact. Straightforward and linear. This is my way, okay? Just out of curiosity, how many of you are more like my mom? Can I see your hand? Like you just branches everywhere, okay? How many of you are like me? Like just straight to the point, boom, 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 okay? Most guys pretty much. The order of judges are the second type. He gives facts after facts after facts, and he doesn't give unimportant details, even though we might be curious. 
And our story for today is one that leaves us wonder, wanting for more information. Because there are many things in the story that make us go, hmm, why, how? And the order does not answer for us. And we have to be okay with it. Because the author does not tell us everything we want to know, but the author tells us everything he wants us to know. Do you see the difference? So today we're in Judges chapter 4, and next week we'll be in Judges chapter 5. And what's interesting about Judges chapter 4 and 5, they're actually talking about the same event, exact same event. However, one is from perspective of historian, and another from perspective of a poet. One is a story, and the other is a song. So today we'll look at the story, what happened, and then next week we'll look at the richer, deeper perspective of the event that the song provides. Now, if you grew up in church, you might know this story as the story of Deborah. Okay, let me ask a quick question. How many of you have Deborah as your one of favorite characters in the Bible? Okay, not many of you, really? I thought it was going to be like the ladies' night. Oh, Deborah! No? But if you grew up thinking, Deborah is my hero, you'd be disappointed. Because that's misleading. In every other cases in the book of Judges, we'll see there's one single human deliverer that God used to save Israel. However, in this story, there's not only one, there are three people that God used to save Israel. There's a woman who judged under a palm tree, a man who leads an army, and a housewife with a pack and a hammer. And notice what is very unusual about this story. Two out of the three deliverers are women. And isn't that amazing? Like, like when I look at the worship team today, they're all ladies. I'm like, are we celebrating the Deborah Day or something like that? But it's cool. I mean, by God's providence, we see that. But if you look at the history of um, narrative, this is probably the earliest narrative with women as heroes of the story. Not just one, but two women. And it tells us something important about God of the Bible. Here's this. That God is faithful to save his people. But the way he does it is often unexpected. He can use anyone at any time, anywhere. Okay? So let's jump into the story. Let's look at the context of the story first, in verse 1 to 3. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. By the way, it's not Ehud, Ehud. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth, Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now notice the word again, because this is the same problem again. Okay? Remember this cycle that we see in Judges chapter 2 sermon? This cycle will continue to be repeated. The problem is the same, and it's never solved. So what happened was, during the time of Ehud, Israel was fine. But the moment Ehud died, Israel go back to the evil way, and because of it, the order tells us that God sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. So from the outside, it looks like Israel is oppressed because they do not have the military power to rival Jabin and the commander of his army, Sisera, because... The Bible tells us that they have 900 chariots of iron, and Israel had none. Now, chariot in those days are like tank of our days. Imagine this. Imagine fighting a war where the enemy has 900 tanks, and we only have foot soldiers. Do you know what we call that? Suicide. Because tanks, iron chariots, can kill foot soldiers like a hot knife cut through body. You know what I mean? Like, like pff, smooth. Powerless. So it seems from the outside like Israel is oppressed because they are powerless before the enemy. But that's not true. Because the order tells us that Israel is in this predicament because they did what is evil in the sight of God. So that means God is the one who's pulling the string behind the scene. And because of that, of course, the people of Israel cry out to God. And God is merciful. Despite the people's unfaithfulness to God, God is faithful to his people. But this is what I want you to see. See, when Ehud was alive, Israel was fine, right? 
But the moment Ehud died, the moment we take away the external constraint, Israel display her true character. Now, can you see why religion does not work? Because religion can make us good people. Oh, yes, it can. If the goal is to be good, religion can do that. Because religion gives us outside pressure and influence that keep us in check. We can be good people because of our surrounding and because of the expectation of people around us. But listen, religion can make us good people, but it cannot make us Christians. Because the moment that external pressure are removed, we show our true colors. Like, let me give you my personal example. Back when I was in high school, not, not too long ago, I hated, I mean, I mean, I hated studying. Anyone know what I'm talking about? All I wanted to do in high school was play games and read manga. And you know what my favorite time of the day is? Whenever my parents are not home. Because I can do whatever I want, right? But the moment I heard their car entering the garage, uh-oh, I immediately turned off my game, put my textbook in front of me, and pretended to study. Okay, don't smile like you don't know what I'm talking about. We all did that, right? So religion can actually make us good because it gives us pressure somehow that I need to perform. It can, be, it can give us behavior modification, but not heart transformation. And that is why Christianity is first and foremost is not a religion. Christianity is good news. It's not about something that we must do. It's about something that's been done on our behalf that changes us from the inside out. So now the people of Israel are back in this sin cycle and they cry out to God. And God answered their cry. And there are three persons that God used to save Israel. Number one, Deborah the judge. Number two, Barak the soldier. And number three, Jael the housewife. Let's look at the first one, the most interesting character. Deborah the judge, verse 4 to 7. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariot and his troop, and I will give him into your hand. So the first person that got used to save Israel is a prophetess by the name of Deborah. And as a prophetess, she preaches the word of God. And we find out that she's the wife of a man by the name of Lapidot. Now, we do not know anything about this man except the fact that he's married to Deborah. But not only a prophetess, but we find out that the people of Israel will come to Deborah for judgment. So that means Deborah is recognized as someone who speaks for God, and people come to her to settle a sort of dispute. And, and in this way, Deborah is very different from all other judges. Because every other judges we see in the book of Judges, they are men of war. But Deborah, she's not a warrior. She's a woman of wisdom. And that is why when God wants to deliver Israel off the hand of Jabin, Deborah summons Barak. It is Barak that God chose to take 10,000 men to Mount Tabor. And God said, I will draw out Sisera and I will give him into your hand. Okay, listen, it is God that will give Sisera and his army into the hand of Barak. It is not the might of Barak and his 10,000 men that will win the war. It is the might of God that will win the war. God is the one who fight for his people. Now, before we go there, we need to talk about Deborah. Okay? I, I am biased. I love Deborah because my sister's name is Deborah. Okay? If you know anything about me and my sisters, I really, really love her. But it's very unusual for Scripture to highlight women's role in leadership. But that's what we see in Deborah. Because Deborah, first of all, she's a prophetess, someone who speaks for God. And she also is a judge in judicial sense, someone who settles dispute among the people. 
So this woman, she holds a leadership position in a culture where women don't have any public significance. To which we have to ask, what happened here? Okay. There are two main views. The traditionalist view and the modern view. Okay, let me explain what happened here. So the traditionalists look at the story of Deborah and call this an anomaly. He says this, well, Judges chapter 4, they are written to tell us what happened, not what should have happened. So they said that at the time of Deborah, here's what happened. There are no men to lead Israel. So therefore, because men neglect their God-given responsibility, here comes Deborah. Deborah step in because men will not. But if you read the story, there's nothing in the story that indicates that. In fact, the story seems to tell us that Deborah is clearly called and gifted by God to do what she does. So she's in this leadership position, not because there's no man to lead, but because of her gifting. But on the other hand, the modern view, okay, this is where we are accustomed with, right? The modern view, look at the story and says this. See, look at Deborah. Anything man can do, woman can do. So they look at the story of Deborah and say, like, there's no differences between male and female. So the gender differences are simply socially constructed fiction. But that for you is also challenged in the text. You know why? Because as amazing as Deborah is, she does not lead the army. She has to recruit Barak. That means Deborah is not Zina, the princess warrior. She has to recruit someone else. So what's the lesson for us? If you've been church, in church long enough, you know this. There's a myth in the church that says this, that man in the church should be taught deep theology, while women should stay home, take our breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and matching sofas and curtains. Let me be loud and clear. In our church, we do not believe that. In our church, we believe that women have access to all spiritual gifts that men have access to. Let me put it another way. In our church, we do not want weak women. We want strong women who love deep theology and maximize their gift for the kingdom of God. Amen, ladies? How come it's, I hear the men? Amen. <laughs> ladies? <laughs> Amen, ladies? See, men and women, we know that men and women are created equal. And they are gifted equally by God. So we are passionate to see more and more women exercise their God-given gift in this church. However, it's also clear that the Bible has established certain position in which he wants only men to take part. Now, for example, look at this story. Deborah will not lead the army even though she is a prophetess and a judge. She has to recruit Barak to lead the army. And what's another part of the interesting part, if you read it, Deborah is mentioned as the wife of Lapidot. Now why? The Bible never does that for men. See, the Bible never introduced a man character and says, hey, let me introduce you. This is Michael, the husband of Kimberly. Because that's a way of saying that even though Deborah is a prophetess and a judge, She's still under the leadership of her husband at home because that is the role that assigned to her. And if we understand this, this got us again two wrong extreme in both directions, where we limit women from exercising their gift or remove gender differences and roles altogether. The Bible teaches the equality of gifting and position, but with distinctive role to play in family and church. Okay, now, all of that to say this. Okay, there are two things that I want to say to the ladies. First, ladies, God has gifted you for God's kingdom. Your calling in life, listen ladies, your calling in life is not simply to marry a husband and sit on the sideline supporting his calling. Like Deborah, God has gifted you and He's calling you to exercise your gift. And that calling looks different to different women. You can't compare one woman to the other because you have different calling, but you do have a calling. 
and you are responsible before God to steward that gift that God has given you. See, my concern sometimes is this. There are some ladies who are too dependent on their husband for their spiritual growth. You know what I'm talking about? And that is not healthy because that's not what you see in Deborah. Deborah is the leader of highest caliber. She's a prophetess. She's a judge. And she exercises a gift to the best of her ability. So if I can encourage all the ladies here, ladies, do not hide behind your husband. Because you have been given gift by God to exercise. But maybe for some of you, maybe, in this season right now, God has called you and gifted you to be a mother. See, we need to realize this, that the calling to be a mother, this is a high calling from God. See, we live in a culture that downplay this. We live in a culture that says, well, if you're a stay-at-home mom, you're wasting your gift and your potential. Okay, we hear this a lot, right? But let me argue otherwise, ladies. Gift of motherhood is extremely crucial. I know sometimes it feels like it's, you know, ordinary. What do you do? As a stay-at-home mother, what do you do? What? Change diapers. Getting kids up and ready for school. Make fancy lunch boxes like Grace to start your kitchen. Run a private Uber for your kids. And try to convince your kids that ice cream and french fries are not equivalent to dinner. So something can feel like it's very mundane and ordinary, but let me tell you, that's not true. Because moms, think about it. Who do you think is the first person that teaches your children the unconditional love of God? From whom did they experience it first? From the pastors? No. Do you realize that? You are the reflection of God's love to your children. And your faithfulness to God's calling of motherhood has strong influence to your child's eternal life. Your role is indispensable. I mean, you, you, all you have to do is just read the biography of spiritual giants in history. Many of them attributed their mothers as one of the earliest and most influential people in their faith. So if you are in that season right now where God called you to be a mother, stay-at-home mother, do not, do not neglect that gift. Use that gift. Maximize it. And that's the first. The second thing, ladies, is this. You can use God's gift while respecting God's order. As you see in the story of Deborah, although God used her greatly, she refused to take the position that God has assigned to men, right? So she still identified herself as the wife of her husband. So that means we must reject both extremes, that God doesn't give women the same spiritual gift as men, that's one. Or the other extreme is that we remove all distinction between male and female in the church. This is how J.D. Gray put it. I love it. The church will never be healthy and thriving until both our sons and daughters thrive within it. Let me repeat that. The church will never be healthy and thriving until both our sons and daughters thrive within it. And my prayer, and I believe Pastor Sam's prayer, is that this church will raise many Deborah. We need Deborah who speak life into their husband and their children. We need Deborah in the ministry who exercise their gift for the health of the church. We need Deborah in society who lead with wisdom, courage, and faith. The point is, when you look at the Bible, women always have a crucial role in the story of God. And for the men, if you're married to a Deborah, listen, don't feel threatened by her. You need to help her cultivate her gift as Lapidot did. God has given you a Deborah, not for you to suppress her, but for you to flourish together with her. And when both of you flourish in your gifting, let me tell you, the church will flourish as well. So the first person that we can see is Deborah. Interesting character. But the second character that we can see in this text, his name is Barak, the soldier. Verse 8 to 10. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. 
But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And 10,000 men went up at his hill, and Deborah went up with him. So the second person that we're going to look at, his name is Barak, and he's a soldier. So many commentaries assume and guess that he's most likely a leader of freedom fighters against Jabin and Sisera. So Deborah comes to him and gives him commission to take his men and fight against Sisera. And Deborah, sure, don't worry, Barak. When you do this, God will go before you. God will give Sisera into your hand. But here is the strange reply from Barak. Barak says this, all right, I will go if you go. If you don't go, I ain't going. So Barak refused to go unless Deborah go with him. And Deborah said, well, of course, sure, I go with you. But Barak, know this, you will not get the glory at the end of this battle. God will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And at this time, we assume the woman will be who? Deborah, right? But we are in for a very big plot twist at the end. So Barak responds to God's call to Deborah, and Deborah's reply to him can be read in two different ways. And I read many commentaries for this because I'm not sure. And they are evenly split on this. Okay, here's the thing, the option that you have. We can either read it as Barak, the man of cowardice, or Barak, the man of faith. Now, let me explain. So the more pessimistic view says, like, when Barak asked Deborah to go with him and refusing to go if she doesn't go, as a sign of Barak's lack of faith. Because he's trying to evade his responsibility as a man. And as a consequence, Deborah rebuked him and told him, Barak, because of that, you will miss the chance of killing Sisera and the glory that comes with it. So they said that Barak missed the glory because of his cowardice. Okay, that's the more pessimistic view. The more optimistic view holds that Deborah is not rebuking Barak. Deborah is simply telling him, although he must fight the battle and do all the hard work, he will not get the glory for it. So Deborah is not rebuking Barak for his lack of faith, but Deborah is doing her role, prophesying to Barak what will happen. Now, let's take a vote. Okay, you got to choose between one of the two, okay? How many of you think it's more pessimistic for you? Can I see your hand? Pessimistic, okay? How many of you think it's more optimistic for you? Okay. My Sunday school teachers tell me, it is the more pessimistic view. But sorry, Sunday school teacher, I disagree with you. I think it's the more optimistic view, okay? Let me tell you why. Barak's desire to take Deborah with him is not a sign of lack of faith. Because it is done out of recognition that Deborah is a prophetess who speaks God's word. Why wouldn't Barak warn her with him? Because he needs to hear and know God's word at all times. And if you remember this conversation, there's a similar conversation that happened many years ago in Exodus chapter 33 between God and Moses. The conversation goes like this. Moses, I'm giving the land of Canaan into your hand. Go, take it, it's yours, but I'm not going. And you know what Moses say? If you ain't going, don't tell me to go. I ain't going. And God say, well, fine, I'm going. Remember that story? That story tells that Moses said, you know, God, unless you are with me, I'm not going to go. Unless your presence is with me, I'm not going. And the same way Barak is showing that faith, because Barak understands that Deborah is God's spokesperson. And Deborah presents God's presence with his people. So Barak said, unless God is with me, I ain't going. And then Deborah replied, sure, I'll go with you. And I think this shows Barak's faith. Because Barak is about to face 900 iron chariots with a foot soldiers. It takes miracle for him to win. And he still go. And here's the clincher. 
he obeys God and lead his man into the war, fully knowing the glory will not be his. The glory of the, he- the war will be given to the hand of woman. And, and Barak is fine. I'm fine with that. Because why? This is a man who does not seek his own glory. His own glory. He does what he must, and he let others have the glory. Now, isn't that what faith is? Faith is seeking and listening to God at all time in every circumstance. Faith is showing courage to trust God with the impossible. And faith is not seeking self-glory, but God's glory. And look at what happened next, verse 12 to 16. When Caesar was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Caesar called out his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Harushat Hagoyim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Caesarah into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Caesarah and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Caesarah got down from his chariots and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harashat Hagoyim. And all the army of Caesarah fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Isn't it amazing? When Barak obeys God, God delivered on his promise. With 10,000 men, he goes to Mantabo. And when Caesar heard of it, he prepared his 900 chariots to fight Barak. And when Deborah uh, ordered the attack, Deborah said, Barak, remember, God has given Caesar into your head. And God has gone out before you. In other words, Deborah reminding Barak, Barak, this is not your battle. This is God's battle. He is the one that will subdue Caesar, and God is the one leading his army into the war. Barak, all you have to do is trust God. You will not achieve victory. You will be given victory. The real battle has been won before the battle is fought. Barak force are no match for Sisera, but Sisera are no match for God. And so God accomplished this victory to the hands of Barak. But Barak is not the source. He's simply the means. God is the one who saved Israel from her enemy. Now, that's an important lesson here that I don't want us to miss, okay? This is a hard lesson, but it's very important. As God uses people to accomplish victory, God makes sure to keep anyone from obscuring the glory. See, God makes us abundantly clear that it is His battle And it is his victory. See, it is God's work from beginning to the end. God alone deserves the glory from the battle. So we understand this. That means this, church. God wants to use you to fight his battle. And God wants to accomplish his victory through you. But heed Deborah's word to Barak. The road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. Oh yes, God will bring victory and in and through us when we put our faith in Him, but the question that we must ask is, are we content with not receiving the glory at the end of the battle? Are we content if another person receives all the glory for all our hard work? Now, so when I study this text, this text really pierced into my heart. It could really speak personally to me. Because as a pastor, I desire to see a growing church. I mean, I desire to see people's lives being transformed by the gospel. Okay? That's why I keep reminding you every week that we want to be people who grow deep in the gospel and reach wide with the gospel, right? See, I want God to bless our church, our ministry, for the sake of God's kingdom in Sydney and all around the world. Do you, do you guys long to see that happen? I long to see this church being used mightily by God for the sake of His kingdom. I want it so bad. I pray for it. But the question is, what if God decides to do all that? Answer all my prayer. But God decided to give the spotlight to Edric 
and not me. What if God says, my time is up, come, come back to me, you see, and he decided to give the spotlight to other preachers and pastors in this church instead of me? Or maybe, what if God answered my prayer for this church in a different church? What if it's the church next door that experienced gospel awakening and received the spotlight? Will I be content? Mm. And this is a necessary reminder for all of us. It is God who brings victory. And we should not care which human instrument seems to shine the most therein. Because to God alone be the glory. Soli Deo Gloria. But there's a third character in the story, and <laughs> this character is probably the most controversial one. Jael, the housewife. Look at first 11 first. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zananim, which is near Kadesh. Jump to verse 17. But Caesar fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Canite, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazar and the house of Heber the Canite. And Jael came out of the come out to meet Caesar and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rock. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man, any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say, No. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent pack and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the pack into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So... He died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went to her tent, and there lay Sisera dead, with the tent peck in his temple. All right. Very violent, I know. But what's amazing about Jael's story, it does not begin in verse 17, because a lot of the when we think about Jael, we think that the story begins in verse 17, or no? Giles' story begins in verse 11. So when we read verse 11, it seems like, you know, a random verse talking about some dude who cannot get along with his neighbor and move his tent to some random place in the desert, right? To which we go, so what? Who on earth cares about someone changing his address? This is not important. But if we think that, we are very wrong. Because verse 11, as weird as it seems, points to God's providence. See, Heber's change of address is an integral part of the story. Because it positions Jael, Heber's wife, precisely where she needs to be to deliver the final blow. See, this change of address places her to be the right person in the right place at the right time. It might not seem important at all at first, but God is setting up his victory through this so what moments. And isn't this how the Bible, the God of the Bible still works today in our life? Here's what we see. There's not a single moment of our life that is wasted. God's providence is always at work, and he planned everything to his little detail. So if you look back to our life, isn't that interesting? we will see that there have been these so what moments that seem very unrelated to anything at the time, that somehow even escaped our attention because they were some so unimportant. Yet when we look back, it turned out to be God's saving help in our life. How many of you can testify to that? That happens to me again and again. See, not even a random change of address is outside of God's plan. God's providence is at work in every little details of our life. What a sovereign God we have. So the story goes like this. So Caesar is on a run for his life. 
And when he got to tents of Jael, Jael supposed to be an ally of Jabin. So when Sisera thinks of Jab, uh, uh, Jael's tent, Jael's tent equals safety. Okay? And when Sisera met Jael, Jael like, come on, come in, come in, come in, come in. You know, very inviting. So she welcomes Sisera, and then she hides Sisera under a blanket, and then give him a milk to drink. And Sisera thinks, like, oh, I'm safe now, I'm safe, I'm cool. So he takes a nap, okay? He must be very exhausted from the battle. And while Sisera is sleeping, Jael approached him quietly with a tent pack and a hammer on her hand. Now, in those days, it is not unusual for women to carry a tent pack and a hammer because setting up and taking down tents is considered a woman's work. Isn't that cool, man? So tent pack and a hammer are essentially a woman household appliance. So today, equivalent, think about this, a frying pan. So here's a woman with a frying pan in her hand. And what she does next is shocking because with her, a tent pack and a hammer in hand, she does not ask WWJD, what would Jesus do? Instead, she approaches Sisera softly and splash! She smashes that tent pack with a hammer into Sisera's head and it comes the most unnecessary explanation in the entire story. So he died. Well, of course. And then she walked out of the tent, dropped the hammer, and say, nail it. Okay, that's not part of the story. <laughs> but can you see what happened? God said that he will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman, and we assume that woman is Deborah. But now it's another woman. And let me tell you, as a soldier in those days, that by a woman is the most devastating, humiliating date that ever. But then God used that. God used the most humiliating defeat to kill Sisera. And the story says this, it is not Deborah who delivers salvation. It is Jael who delivers the hammering salvation. God used a housewife to kill God's enemy. It is unexpected salvation. And when Barak gets to the tent, Jael invites him to get into the tent and see the cup of Sisera with a tent pack hammered into his head. And I'm sure Barak is thinking, I'm glad she's not my wife. Verse 23 and 24. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. God delivered his promise. God used Deborah, Barak, and Jael. But listen, ultimately, it is God who defeats the enemy. You see that in verse 23? It is God who subdues Jabin. Not Deborah, not Barak, it's not Jael. It is God who acts on the behalf of his people. And he does so not because his people deserve it, he does so because of His grace and mercy alone. That's why we can say, God deserves all the glory. Salvation is all of God's doing from beginning to the end. And to Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So what's the lesson here? There are two lessons. First, men, do not mess. Do not mess with a woman who holds a frying pan in her hand. That's the first lesson. Second lesson, we must act violently towards God's enemy. See, a lot of people have issue with what Jael did. They said that the Bible will not condone this act of violence. She was very violent and she broke the law of hospitality of her day. Well, the problem with that is, as we will look at next week in, uh, in chapter 5, Jael is praised for what she did. She's praised for it. Now, I'm not saying we should do the same to our enemy today. So don't hear me saying, go home, be nice to your enemy, give him a cup of wine, sing him a lullaby, and smash his head with frying pan. Don't do that, OK? 
okay? Listen, don't be Jael, because if you are Jael, you will go to jail. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. <laughs> Today, we no longer no live in the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament where we are called to love God and love our enemies and live vengeance to God. But if we understand the story of the book of Judges, the book of Judges is a story of God's salvation for God's people. And in this story, we see Jael risk everything to execute God's enemy and help God's people. And that should be our attitude towards sin. We should not play around with sin. We should treat sin the way Jael treated Sisera. Get a nail, get a hammer, and smash it in the head. Because God is serious about eliminating the enemy of God's people. And therefore, we should be violent towards sin. And I close with this. Isn't that the story of the cross? The cross tells us how seriously God takes sins. The cross is extremely violent. See, the cross is not only the place where we are forgiven and we are made right with God, and that's true. But the cross is the proof that God does judge and punish sin seriously. Because the cross is what we deserve because of our sin. We deserve nail and ha hammered into our hands and feet and bleed to death. But this is what's amazing about the gospel. We deserve the cross. But rather than making us take the nail and the hammer, God came to us and took the nail and the hammer on our behalf. We should be the one who received the blow. But at the cross, Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, became the enemy of God. Every blow against sin is nailed into his body. He absorbed every drop of God's wrath until there is no more, so that whoever today put his faith in Jesus will never, ever experience God's wrath. Because at the cross, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, so that fin sinful people like you and I can become the righteousness of God in him. And my friend, this is the point of the story. It points us to the ultimate story of the gospel, where it is not about Deborah, Baal, or Jerak. Yes, God used them as a means of salvation, that the point of the story is God is showing us the true salvation that he will give to his people. God is the hero of the story. God is faithful toward his unfaithful people. And the cause of God's faithfulness to the unfaithful people is nailed, hammered on Jesus' body. So that for all of us today who receive that costly salvation, our natural response is to say, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you who act on our behalf. We do not deserve you at all. We do not deserve your kindness and your grace at all. What we deserve is nail hammered into our body for our sin. But you sent your one and only Son to took that punishment on our behalf. So that today, today that we can become sons and daughters of God. And I pray, Lord, as we understand the story of the gospel, as we understand the story of our salvation, I pray that it leads us to worship you. It leads us to cry out from our heart that solely the oh glory that you alone that deserve the glory. All our hard work, all everything that we do is not for our sake, but it's for you who has done everything for us. So right now, I want to pray for my friends in this place who maybe right now we are in that place that we have yet to know you. We have yet to trust in your salvation. And today, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you continue to convict their heart in such a way that today, for the first time in our life, we can confidently say that the Lord is my salvation, that Jesus is my righteousness, that I trust him, I put my faith in him, I want him to be my God, my king, my salvation. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you do that in our heart. And I pray that if it's just any of us in this place, Lord, who are questioning your goodness, I pray that you remind us that you have shown it once and for all at the cross. Your son 
receive the nail that we deserve. That's how we know that you will never ever abandon us. That's how we know that you are faithful to us. Help us to look at that. No matter what kind of situation that we face right now, help us to glory in the story of the gospel. And we ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray.